Hi, y'all. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We're just going to give it one or two more minutes for the last few people to uh, come in and join us, and then we'll get started. And I am very excited for today's webinar, too. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all so much for being here this morning. And first of all, we would like to apologize for last week. I know a bunch of uh, a bunch of y'all were left waiting in the waiting room, on not knowing that the session had been rescheduled. Uh, it was completely uh, unintentional to not communicate that well to you, and we apologize for that. We have rescheduled the session. It will be Monday, July 31st, uh, same time, 9 to 12. And at the end of the session today, I have a, a link to, um, to that registration form, so you'll be able to re-register for the new session. Um, so again, we apologize for that, but we will make it up and we will also make that reporting category two available via um, our, Edu our um, EduSmart YouTube channel. So if you can't attend, um, I know we're getting close into beginning of the year and it starts to get super busy, um, you'll have access to the recording if nothing else. So um, thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, I was telling my co-host that, you know, Earth and Space is one of my absolute favorite uh, topics. So this one is, uh, I can really get into this one. If I start talking too much, you know, just you know, give me the shush sign or something, um, because I do get excited about it. This is one of my favorites. So to give you a little preview for today, um, we're going to meet the TEKS uh, using the 5e lesson cycle. Um, I'm not going to test you on them later. That will come in your classroom. So, um, but we'll do the other, we'll do four out of five of these as far as um, how we can introduce them. We'll take a quick break um, around 10, 10, 15 ish. And then we're going to come back and talk about the recurring themes and concepts and how we can connect these TEAK, like the obvious, the, the best connections for our students. And then we'll head to breakout rooms where it's a share -thon. Um In Earth and Space, especially, things are changing grade level a lot. So things are just, there. there is a lot of new content, but a lot of just shifting around where the content is taught. And so it's going to be really helpful to get with your um, either elementary or secondary folks and have ideas of how they already are teaching this like we don't need to reinvent the wheel so we're going to give you plenty of time to collaborate and be able to share ideas about how we can talk about these um, new topics with our students and ideas of lessons that we're already doing so that's just kind of a, a roadmap for where we're heading today um, talking about earth and space we're going to start with our anchoring phenomenon and let me make sure i am sharing my sound and here we go here we go angering phenomenon So anything that you notice in the video that you think could relate back to why we would be talking about that, considering we're looking at the Earth and Space um, reporting category. 
What do you notice about the video? What did you see? Uh, any observations or connections? You can put them in the chat or feel free to come off of mute. And um, what questions do you have about the video? About our Earth in One Minute. give you just a second to type in the chat. I know it takes just a moment for that. Just trying to kind of um, use that anchoring phenomenon to get us thinking about our content for Earth and Space, what connections you might be able to make from that. Uh, the first thing that I noticed and I really liked is that it's real life Earth is uh, have a student connect to what Earth is, the things that happen on Earth and in space, uh, the beautiful pictures and just uh, color and everything. And this is what Earth is about. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great observations. Do you think it did a good job covering the history of the Earth in 60 seconds or less? <laughs> That's kind of a hard thing to do, considering the scale of time we're looking at. Um, but it did a pretty good job, like from Big Bang to now in 60 seconds. That was amazing. And um, y'all, let's buckle up because that's our job now is between kindergarten and eighth grade. We're going to teach them everything. Um, yeah, it's it's a lot, but it. It did a great job of just like introducing the entire history of the earth. And then our job is to kind of put that scale onto it. Um, talking about recurring themes, that scale proportion and quantity. <laughs> it um, it shows also, I think with Ms. Garza says, it kind of shows how fragile our world is, like how much change really occurs. Um, and so one of the big new themes in um, Earth and Space is conservation. Like, get ready for that as well. We are going to be teaching a lot of um, conservation of Earth's natural resources and reducing the impact of humans on our Earth resources. Um, we've added a whole new kind of... Um, category for that within this earth and space reporting category so that's actually i feel very exciting that's um, a topic i'm pretty passionate about too so we're gonna go ahead and dive into um the practice on exploring this this standards and the best way to do this of course is to experience it yourself so i'm going to share a link in the chat to our activity for, um, this is a Google um, activity. And your job is to, on each of these reporting cat or each of these grade levels, these are drag and drop. So anything in green is the new 2024 standards. Anything in blue is the current 2017 streamlined standards, the ones that we're working with now. So in columns, we're going to try and match up the new teaks to the old teaks. And some of them are going to match up easily, and some of them are not. And if they don't match, then just leave them kind of hanging off to the side. So I have um, a blue teak here. That's one of our old teaks. And I'm going to drag it to the side that says blue. And it says observe, describe, and illustrate sky objects such as the sun, moon, and stars. And I have one that kind of matches that here in kindergarten. So I'm going to move it and I'm going to kind of match it up with each other. So we're going to do this for all of the standards. You can choose your grade level to kind of get started with that. And then you can go to any other grade level and kind of help sort those out as well. Um, you feel free to communicate, talk, chat throughout this, um, especially if you're in a grade level working with someone else. Um, did everybody get the link to this activity? I just put it in the chat. Click on the activity, and then you're going to sort the standards based on blue being the current teaks and green being the new teaks. Any questions on that? Mm 
Okay, so we'll have several minutes to work on that. Um, and we're just kind of getting a good overview. I could explain these, but again, um, that explore piece is so important. And so we want you to be able to have the opportunity to explore them yourself. All right, we have just a couple more grade levels, um, first grade, third grade, and sixth. Um, if you're done with your grade level, you can head over to one of those and kind of start seeing if we can sort those out. See a lot of movement still going on with um, like fourth grade, second grade. Yeah, still trying to figure out if and how they might align. Hopefully discovering some of those new characteristics, new standards, new patterns that you might see. Um, we'll talk about them in, you know, in more detail, but just as kind of an overview, um, starting with kinder, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that are very similar. Um, as someone pointed out, there is more specificity. So a lot of, uh, one of the themes that you'll see throughout the standards is that we are adding not only rigor, which they are definitely adding rigor, um, but also they, uh, an attempt has been made to make the standards more measurable. So there's a lot more um, classifying and describing and explaining as opposed to just understanding or whatever. They're, they're trying to make it more measurable. Um, and so you can see that in a lot of the standards as we go through. Um, not necessarily huge changes in kinder, but um, but overall, you know, <laughs> a, a little more in depth, and that's going to be tough for our, our youngest baby. I say that it's going to be tough for the kids, but it's going to be really tough on our young elementary teachers because it's already so challenging to get time to do science. And now we're adding some really um, hands on kind of stuff. And that's another kind of overarching theme that you'll see is they're adding a lot of things to make it more hands on modeling. Um, not just explaining, but also classifying and generating ideas and things like that. We're making it much more student centered and hand on hands on. So kind of you'll see that over our overarching throughout all of them is um, a lot more investigating modeling um, and hands on kind of thing. First grade is yeah, all over the place. And um, I feel like this graphic does a great job of explaining how all over the place it really is. It's um, a lot of the standards are new. First grade is, has big changes compared to some of the other grade levels. Um, and a lot of them are uh, moving around from other grade levels. So there's there are some that have been taken out, which is good, and moved to different, moved to kinder, kinder or third. Um, but they've also added several. You can see we're we're adding some that just don't have anything that they line up with. Uh, second grade is um, a lot of movement around. There's some interesting little um, tweaks with second grade. Um, but overall, it's still lining up pretty well as far as what they were doing and what they are doing now. Um, one big change is right here in this uh, severe weather. Uh, we've moved those catastrophic events and severe weather way down to second grade. So that's a big change and it's going to be a little interesting to see how that works out for um, our youngest. A lot of this is Texas, so a lot of students here in Texas do already have experience with things like floods and hurricanes and tornadoes, um, but it also can be really scary for them. So, you know, that'll have to, excuse me, be handled kind of delicately. Uh, third grade, we obviously don't have any third grade teachers here because we didn't uh, sort this one. I will say third grade is one of the, I don't want to say it's not going to be a challenge still, but it is less affected. Um, most of the standards had some kind of correlation to a prior standard. So there's not a lot of new in third grade. But fourth grade um, and up, basically starting here, oh, buckle up, I'll say it again, looking at our anchoring phenomenon, how we covered um, 
the history of Earth in one minute, that's that's going to be reporting category three for all of us. Um, there's just a, a lot going on. Um, one good thing with fourth is that there's not really teaching specifically weather. Like you don't have to go out and record the weather patterns anymore. Um, so that'll be nice. But you do have to differentiate between weather and climate. So, <laughs> um, so there's things that make up for that. Uh, and then again, through every grade level, you're going to notice so much more conservation, like really, really pushing um, understanding our use of natural resources and how to conserve them, how to uh, protect them, how to be good stewards of them. So all good stuff there. Fifth grade doesn't have much new. It is um it lines up fairly well, but it does go into more depth and it is definitely more hands on. Um, it's very practical. We're moving into a more practical application of these concepts. Things like um, how does how does this affect something else? And so we're looking more at that cause and effect and we're looking at um, how does this affect our daily choices? Um, You'll notice a lot of fifth grade now includes modeling. So they have um, really upped the rigor with being able to not only describe or identify, but being able to model the um, processes on the earth. So that's kind of a big change for fifth grade. Sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, the intent here was to make it more vertically aligned. And, and really that is throughout the, the standards is they wanted to, there's an attempt to make it much more vertically aligned. And so to do that for middle school, because of the way the TEKS were structured now, where sixth grade and eighth grade are pretty closely aligned, but seventh grade is kind of an island of life science, there's massive changes to these grade levels. Um, what's coming in, what's going out, and seventh grade teachers are definitely going to feel the impact um, significantly because there's stuff in seventh grade that most seventh grade teachers haven't taught ever um, or have been gone for many, many years. So you'll notice just huge changes in where things are in seventh grade, but a lot of it is moving around grade levels. So it's going to be really, really important for middle school teachers to communicate and share and collaborate and get ideas and lessons from your from your peers. This is um, seventh grade, you'll notice there's a lot more of the green standards than there were of the blue standards, right? So there's a lot more seventh grade earth and space than there was before. And some of it's pretty um, in-depth like tectonic plates and um, describing the locations and movements of things like the sun and the moon and meteors and asteroids and they added a bunch of things on that like the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud um, so it's very in-depth compared to what it used to be and um, again seventh grade teachers aren't really used to teaching gravity and things along those lines um, and then we're adding again that conservation feature when <laughs> One very notable change in middle school, and this one just just stabs me in the heart. Um, we are no longer have anywhere in our standards human space exploration. So there's nothing about um, the standard that says how we still how uh, the Earth supports life is still there, but nothing about how humans live in space or explore space or the history of space exploration or the future of space exploration. There's no space exploration. So I think that um, is a big change. They took it out to like make the scope and sequence more manageable, but it's really sad. Like, I don't know how we can teach that still somehow because I, I feel like that's really important and we don't do it. Eighth grade. Um, Notice there's a lot more blue than green. So we've moved a lot of things out of eighth grade and pushed them down into sixth, especially, and somewhat into seventh. Um, but that doesn't really mean you're off the hook for an eighth grade teacher, because when we look into uh, organisms in the environment next week, there's a whole lot more added there. So um, they've taken some of the earth and space out and added a lot more category four. Um, but it 
it has streamlined eighth grade significantly. And I think that's a really great thing. Um, it might open up some time for a little extra review, that kind of thing. Um, again, there are some things that have been deleted. And if, you know, eighth grade teachers, I know you'll probably like dance and cheer for this, but we have completely taken topographical maps out of the scope and sequence. Like no more topographical maps at all. Because those were so not fun. Um, so that's a good one. Otherwise, a lot of it's just streamlining. Um, and then when we get into the details on this, they've done some interesting things with conservation on eighth grade, um, like as the culmination of all these years of looking at natural resources and conservation and you know protecting and how we use them. And then in eighth grade, we look at um, how humans impact them both or how the natural events affect them as well as how humans affect them. So it's kind of nice um, to be able to look at it through that lens. So that's like the culmination of where eighth grade ends up. So what other, any other comments or patterns about this sorting activity where you kind of get to actually see how they line up? Is anyone surprised at what you see or see something that, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lot of ways that it really has um, reduced the overall scope of it and made it more specific. All right, awesome. So um, having explored this overall, we're going to go into a lot more in depth with each grade level. Yes, uh, ki the kids did hate, hate, hate topographical maps. And I think that was a really good thing to remove. Um, some other things that have been completely eliminated in seventh grade, we no longer teach Texas eco regions. Um, seventh grade doesn't have weathering erosion and deposition really anymore. Um, and so that's, I don't know, that's a good change and a bad change. It was a very specific standard, um, but it also is great exposure to the state. So, you know, jury's out on that one. Uh, otherwise, we also have deleted um, like specific moon phases. They don't have to know the name of all the moon phases anymore. So that's kind of cool. Uh, they have to know the patterns of moon, but not the actual, like, less focus on waxing gibbous or whatever. <laughs> so I think that's a good change, too. All right. So going through that activity, hopefully kind of gave you a little bit of an overview. Um, but specifically to look at the side by side and the vertical alignment and how this plays out in um, in actual standards. We do have a link for you for that practice activity. Um, every So we met two weeks ago for reporting category one, and hopefully those documents have reached you by now. They, um, they were definitely slow to go out um, because of the same issues that caused us to miss last week. So if you haven't received the um, all of this, like the slide deck and the recording from reporting category one, just please let me know. Um, and then again, we rescheduled uh, reporting category two for July 31st. And then these documents will go out within the next couple of days. So um, so you'll have, okay. Yeah, if you didn't get it, just please let me know. You can put it in the chat or you can email me at my email address is leah at edgesmart.com. And we will make sure that you get your um, certificate for attending your you know, hours for CTE, and then also the documents. Um, and we do have a, a, a list of everyone who attended that session. Um, so we'll make sure that those, I will make sure that those go out this week. All right, so I'm seeing, yeah, apparently they just didn't. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, like we had a bit of a crazy week, which led to last week uh, and the, and you know, the, the session being canceled and not communicated. So we do apologize and we will make sure that that gets corrected. 
Um, but the best thing is you get a link to this alignment practice documents. So if you're, you know, a team lead, you want to help your colleagues kind of start learning and comparing this. Um, it's always better to do it yourself hands on as opposed to just sit and listen. So this is a great way to really figure out what's changed, what's new, and how things are lining up for all of those um, reporting categories. Looking at, okay, awesome. Thank y'all for letting me know and we will make sure you get everything. So here we go, let's take a closer look going to uh, work through the explain section now there are a lot of changes so we're we're highlighting some of the most important changes that doesn't mean we're going through every single thing that changed so it's still you know important to look at the actual standards but for each grade level we're going to kind of look at how the flow works and what each level is learning and that way you know that vertical alignment piece is super important um, and I do think we've corrected it a lot with this new standards like it is it's really well done as far as the vertical alignment piece um, and it's important to know where they're getting exposure to these materials so with that said um, some of the things you'll notice is that a much better alignment anything 0.9 is that sun moon space solar system um, kind of category Anything 0.10, so 1.10, 2.10, 3.10, all of that is our earth systems and materials. And notice it says earth systems. Um, the actual knowledge and skill statement has changed on most of the 0.10s, where it's now specifically saying, looking at the systems of the earth and the processes of the earth. Um, before it was more about natural re or yeah resources um not necessarily looking at it as a pattern or as a system and then we've taken that natural resource and conservation from all over earth and space that where it was before and and put all of it into the point 11s so all grade levels have something to do with understanding natural resources and conservation um there is a very heavy emphasis on that it's not only, it's understanding the benefits, the disadvantages of using um, both new renewable and non-renewable resources and understanding the impact of humans and then how to manage those resources. So um, really good emphasis and like learning pattern throughout the grade levels for how to take care of our planet. Um, it just, it takes, it, there was a lot of that in the standards already. It's just really made it um, more concise and more focused and more um, emphasis placed on that. The other thing is the emphasis on hands-on and interconnectedness. We're looking for how one thing affects another. And um, there's lots more of that. And they do it in a very hands-on way. So you'll notice the verbs have changed a lot to be more hands-on, things like modeling and investigating, um, and things that are more measurable, analyzing, designing solutions. Um, those are all more measurable standards than what they were before. So a lot of the verbs have changed. You'll really need to pay attention to the new verbs. And one other great, what I consider a really great change is that we're looking for practical applications. So they've added language that says, how is this important to everyday life? What is the impact of our choices on this standard um, and finding solutions? So it makes it more practical and it makes it more concrete, I think, especially for our younger grade levels. So why does it matter that I know that what seasons are changing and what is coming next? Like, why does it matter to me in my everyday life? So those are all great. Um, more specificity, um, but also more concrete. So you'll notice those kind of overview things throughout all grade levels. And then let's, we're going to talk about each grade level individually. We do have a link for every grade level, the vertical alignment piece. I'll go to this one, um, a side by side, excuse me. So I just want to done a great side by side. 
and it it does exactly what we just did in that practice where you'll see the um the old teaks are in blue the new ones are in green and then we highlight a lot of the changes so i'm just going to scroll down to earth and space you'll see which ones are new like this uh, includes freshwater versus saltwater, which moved down from second grade. Um, this moved down from kindergarten or up from kindergarten. So it tells you where things came from. Um, and you can really use this to understand the big changes in the standards. I will also say Lead Forward has an amazing side-by-side. -side. Um, it took me several different sources looking at looking at it in many different ways to really understand the impact. Um, so I highly recommend lead forwards uh, side by side, as well as edge of smarts. Um, and combining those two kind of really for me helped understand the standards in a way I don't think I would have otherwise. But looking at kindergarten, um, we have it's a lot of moving around of the standards like weather was already there, but it moved down to this um, more earth patterns. Um, another uh, big change um, was that you no longer are teaching seasons in first grade. Seasons, yeah. Again, Teeks Resource also has a really good side-by-side. -side. So using all of those different resources together very much helps to put it all, you know, really understand it in depth. Um, one another big change is that knowledge and skill statement again we're talking about materials and systems so even in kindergarten we're now wanting to look at it as a system and use that language explicitly the earth is a system um the weather is a system you know making sure that they understand that everything is interconnected and then we're really increasing the rigor um by doing things like classifying um, and then it, the kids here in the K-11, they have to generate examples of practical uses for rocks, water, and soil. Um, before, it was just kind of, uh, it was much more um, know them, but now we need to actually, like, they had to be able to say, what are they? But now they have to come up with their own. So that's um, another increased level. Uh, engineering design challenges work great for this. So give them these materials, rock, soil, and water, and how can I make something with it, something useful, something practical. Uh, I, we wrote a engineering design challenge where they are coming up with a new piece of playground equipment using just those materials. Hey, practical examples. But they have to do it for each one of them. This is also a new standard where it says the air around us, uh, this moved down from first grade, so they want to they want the students to understand that wind is air and that the air is all around us. So you'll need things like pinwheels and wind socks and ribbons and understanding wind is moving air. Those are the big changes. Yes. Uh, I will say um, the engineering design challenges are uh, built in throughout. So you, again, you saw that there's more modeling and investigating. It's much more hands-on and much more student-led. And that comes from the science and engineering practices. So we're going to be building a lot, like using the content to really get that practical application. Um, we did a whole series last month on all the other parts of the contents that changing. So the science and engineering practices, recurring themes and concepts um, and 3D learning. And one of the biggest changes is that we are now not just doing science, but we're also doing engineering. So science is understanding how things work and engineering is using how science works to make solutions. And so being able to build something, being able to build and create and solve something with an actual model or some kind of um, project like that is such a great extension in the classroom. Um, so I love that we're including that engineering component. We're not only understanding the world around us, but we're solving problems using that understanding. Moving to first grade. 
um, some some fairly large changes. Um, one of the again the the rigor is in depth, much more in depth. Um, when we're talking about soil, you now have to include particle size and the components of soil. So there was already like you know shape and and all of that stuff, but now it's particle size and components. Now that's going to be um, challenging vocabulary for the students, just that academic vocabulary, not to mention the actual specific applying it to content because they've now included the such as. So such as means you have to um, include these. That is topsoil, clay, and sand. So they've added a lot of uh, detail to that standard. And this uh, 1.10 B is completely new. Um, this is an introduction to weathering, erosion, and deposition. And that used to start in second grade. In this case, we are describing how water can move rocks and soil from one place to another. In second grade, you explore how water and wind can move rocks and soil. And then in third grade is water, wind, and ice. So that vertical alignment, we're building step by step a little better understanding of weathering, erosion, and deposition. So in first grade, you now need to investigate how water can move rocks. Now I'm going to show you some pictures later of creating your own mini erosion tables and understanding that this <laughs> Uh, this this con the standard is like everywhere. Um, I would very much uh, suggest that you invest in mini erosion tables because they're going to be using them a lot in every grade level for lots of different reasons. Um, first grade also increasing that depth of knowledge for um, water. You now have added puddles, ponds, and streams in addition to rivers, lakes, and oceans. And they're looking at it not only for color, clarity, size, shape, but we're adding, is it freshwater or saltwater? So they have to know more types of um, bodies of water and they have to know more about them. So that's going to take some more time. Um, this is one of those where we added the practical application. So explain the impact of weather on daily choices. That's um, I think a great thing because you can really relate it to what the students are doing every single day. Um, although you're still going to have that kid who shows up in a hoodie on a 110 degree day, you know, that's just what they do. Um, for 1.11, so I, I should say 1.9 on this didn't really change much at all. Um, the big changes were here. And then 1.11, this first one was really just reclassified, but it has added some additional details. So now it's describing plants, animals, and humans and how they use rock, soil, and water. So when we did the breakout on this, you have to explain how plants use rock, soil, and water, how animals use rock, soil, and water, and how humans use rock, soil, and water. So it's actually a lot in there to make sure that you're hitting all different combinations of those. And then B and C are both new, brand new, um, and they're conservation. So they're learning why conservation is important and describing ways to conserve water. So things like, you know, turning off the sink when you're brushing your teeth or, you know, not watering the lawn as much or whatever that happens to be. But this is their foundation of conservation. And this is when they're really learning what that concept means. So this is going to, and they just build from here. So it's going to be really important to um, get a solid understanding of conservation and why it matters. Second grade, of course, we have the side by side again. Um, one of the big changes here is there's there's always been a common misconception with the students that the moon generates its own light. And that started in third grade and up. And so they probably haven't thought about it just a whole lot by second grade. So we're going to get ahead of that curve by telling them now that the moon does not generate its own light. It is only reflecting light from the sun. So that moved down a grade level in order to get ahead of that misconception. The 2.9B is interesting because 
um, it says observe objects in the night sky and compare how they look with your naked eye versus with a tool, but telescopes are not included in the grade two tool list. So that's um, if you know if you're your instructional folks or your supply folks are looking at the supply list, they're not going to see telescope, but it specifically says it in the standard that they have to know what a telescope is and how things are different in a telescope with the naked eye. Now, to me, this like screams a really great opportunity to do some kind of science night, maybe a STEM night where they get the opportunity to look through a telescope at the night sky because otherwise we teach during the day and that's kind of make things difficult of course the moon is um, visible during the day a lot of times and you could certainly use the moon as an example um, but it also just know that you need to have some sort of telescope um, some sort of option for them to magnify objects in the sky and then um this this one has gone you no longer have to record patterns of objects that's now moved to third grade and 2.10 this is where you really see the um, knowledge and skill statement has changed to adding systems and processes um the actual standards here haven't changed much other than this new standard that says um severe weather such as hurricanes tornadoes and floods and they need to understand that these events happen are more likely to happen in some areas than others. So they need to understand that hurricanes happen near the coast, that tornadoes happen in tornado alley, that floods happen more often in floodplains. Like that's not just knowing that there is severe weather that happens, but also where it happens. So that's gonna be a little more in depth for sure. And then on the conservation part, um, they're just expanding on the idea that earth materials are important to everyday life. Um, these two standards didn't actually change much except, um, so natural and man-made resources were already there in the standards, um, but this one is describing how human in impact can be limited by our choices. So again, now we're making it much more personal. What choices are you making? You know, don't have a straw with your lunch or whatever that looks like, um, how that can, their own personal choices can make a difference. Any questions on those early elementary grades? That's K through two so far. Um, there is a lot more rigor and depth to the standards and that is, that's going to be tough when you're already struggling to fit in science. Um, there's lots of ways to overcome that by making it more cross-curricular, um, but it is going to be very, very foundational for the rest of science. So it's going to be really important that we, we get that science time in. I know that's easy to say and much harder to do. All right, moving on to upper elementary, third grade. Again, this is probably um, one of the least affected, like as far as um, the changes, not much has changed here. We have added some rigor. Um, we have added the hands-on component. Notice um, in knowledge and skills, it goes to investigate and explain and model and describe. Um, so lots of hands-on. The natural resources part, there really were this, these standards were already in there. They just kind of broke them out to make them more specific and then move them to their own um, 3.11. So it's all about conservation. And then it does add more specific language, like how do we use natural resources for construction, agriculture, transportation, and to make products before it was just to make products. So the big change there. Fourth grade, um, one of the big changes is that you don't have to record weather patterns, right? So you don't have to go out every day for six weeks and record the weather. That's a great one. Um, and that uh, patterns or sequence uh, standard, it, you're looking at seasons only. Um, we don't have to look at the patterns and shadows anymore until fifth grade. Um, it just kind of 
made more sense, I think, to be looking at it in terms of the like focusing on those patterns of the moon and patterns in how objects change, as opposed to um, having to get that specific and looking at shadows. Um, and this is a big change as well, where we're looking at the moon patterns, but the focus is on the recognition of the pattern, not the name. So we don't have to worry about um, full moon, new moon, um, waxing, waning, all of those terminologies. In the tens, um, water cycle has not changed. Weathering erosion, dif different dif deposition has not changed other than we're now modeling it. So again, we're going to teach you how to do a mini erosion table, and it's going to be so useful for every grade level for modeling. Um, but this one is new. It moved down from grade five. We're differentiating between weather and climate. So weather, of course, is short term. Climate is long term. And they really just need to know that terminology, the difference between them. Venn diagram, you're good to go, but it has to be it fit in there somewhere. Um, in the natural resources, this really didn't change. It was mostly just reworded and repositioned in the standards. Um, the biggest change is that you're now looking at advantages and disadvantages of both renewable and non-renewable resources. So what are the advantages of using, using renewable resources? What are the advantages of using non-renewable resources? You know, that's, that's tough. Um, the disadvantages of renewable resources, the cost, um, things like that, you know, it doesn't generate as much power. Um, you'll have to kind of, you know, give them, we're giving them the full picture, not just um, looking at, well, of course we know non-renewables are bad, so why are people still using them? Well, they're a lot less expensive, they generate more power. So it gives that, um, that overall view of it. The rest of it is mostly just kind of reworded. Um, the 411C here is brand new. Uh, physical properties of rocks that allow the Earth's resources to be stored there. And we're talking about rocks only because soil has been moved down to third grade. Um, so it's just, you know, how, how do we, how is coal found underground? How is natural gas found underground? We're wanting to give them a glimpse of that process. Fifth grade, um, we added, well, first of all, there's quite a bit that's been taken out, right? So that differentiate between weather and climate is now in fourth grade. The water cycle has just moved. Um, the physical characteristics of the sun, moon, and earth has been deleted. That's gone up to sixth grade and seventh grade. So that helps. Um, and then we do have added um oh wait the shadows is added here so when you're talking about five nine there's only one five nine a it's rotation um of the earth that causes the day night cycle and then the pattern of shadows so it kind of does make sense to put that here i think that's a good alignment piece in 510 you'll notice it really just has added that hands-on component model and describe there is also some additional specificity as far as um, what landforms. So there is some additional detail, but the biggest change is we're now having to model. And it's specific that you have to create models. Um, the natural resources, I love that they have added explain solutions. So how do we minimize the impact of our use on natural resources? In fourth grade, they really look in depth at how we use them, the good stuff, the bad stuff, all of it. Now, how do we create solutions? Again, your engineering design challenges are perfect for this. Um, ways to use other resources, ways to make them uh, extend our resources further, um, things that we can do to to help, we have to use our natural resources. We have to use trees to make buildings. Um, we have to use those types of uh, materials like rare earth materials and all. Um, how can we minimize that impact? Again, very practical. 
once so uh, any questions there on um, that upper elementary grades again very brief overview but it kind of pointing out some of the highlights for you to be able to understand where things are going moving up into middle school again the biggest change here is just the vertical alignment um and then they have taken out a few things in order to make it more feasible to have this much in each grade level um notice the knowledge and skill statement for 6.9 it says include um it says model the cyclical movements of the sun earth and moon and describe their effects so already with just that knowledge and skill statement we're getting more rigor um, because we have to include modeling for all of the different standards um this is where we've taken out that physical properties of the sun and moon all that moved to seventh grade um, the exploration of gravity and the impact of gravity has moved to grade seven and space exploration is gone entirely so this is where they explored like the history of space exploration um no longer have to do that so the big focus these two first standards a and b were both moved down from eighth grade and um, it says model and illustrate how a tilted earth rotates on its axis and that causes um, the day night cycle and how it revolves around the sun, which causes the seasons. So that's a lot in that one standard, all about the movement of the earth. And then sixth grade teachers, y'all are gonna hate this, but you now get to teach tides. So um, we describe and predict daily spring and neap cycle of tides due to gravitational forces so that's kind of tough because the the real um explanation of gravity has kind of been moved to seventh grade <laughs> and yet you're teaching that tides occur because of gravity from the moon and the sun so that one's gonna be fun no definitely not a silly question so uh, the question in the chat is when do the new teaks go into effect and we are definitely getting a jump on them right now this is um one year ahead of time so these teaks will be effective in the 2024 2025 school year this year is a great time to kind of just dip your toes in start understanding them and it gives you time to really look at your scope and sequence, your lesson plans, what lessons you do and see what can still work and what can be moved to other grade levels. Um, so that that's kind of the purpose of why we're looking at them so far in advance. I will say also it depends on the school, the individual um, ISD, because a lot of our districts are actually going ahead and implementing sixth grade, uh, third grade and sixth grade because of the way the testing works. Um, some districts have decided that that's a better, better option for them. So it does depend on your district. You'll need to make sure and follow district guidelines, but officially they do not go into effect until 2024 school year. Um, rock cycle, I, I do really think they did a good job on this part. They have simplified it a lot. So we're no longer talking about the Athena sphere. We're talking about biosphere, hydrosphere, atmosphere, and geosphere. But they need to know those terms really well because they use them from here on out. Um, in in seventh grade, they talk about you know how changes affect the hydrosphere, and they have to know automatically that that means the water parts of the Earth. Um, the layers of the Earth are much more simplified and more accurate inner core outer core mantle crust that's all they have to know um so that is going to be a lot easier so the question in the chat is will this year sixth graders be graded on the current teaks or the new teaks and that's an excellent question according to tea they are so if a standard is moving down um 
or up a grade level, I should say. So if a standard has been taught in sixth grade and now it's taught in seventh grade, there's going to be a gap of students who never get taught that material. According to TEA, they are not going to test anything that is a gap in the in the way the students are learning until after all the students have moved through this grade level. So anything with a gap, they are not going to test on. According to TEA, um, how long that applies, you know, does it, how long does that work for? I don't know. Um, there is a gap though, and we, we're going to have to make, like for EdgeSmart, what we've chosen to do is make specific playlists, playlists that address those gaps so that maybe when you have like a day or two between units or something, you could do a gap lesson. Um, that's one way of addressing it. Those gaps will have to be addressed. So there's just going to be some materials in this switch next year. And I think that's why a lot of the student, a lot of districts have decided to go ahead and uh, move forward with sixth, third and sixth grade is to help eliminate some of those gaps. Um, but yeah, there's going to be materials that the students just don't learn. It has to with the way things are moving from so many grade levels and moving around so much and a lot of that's going to happen in middle school but other grades also so um hopefully tea will will keep to that and not test on gap um, gap knowledge but as teachers we still need them to have that information like that's our job is to teach them those so it's going to be tough for a while and it's going to be we'll have to see kind of how it plays out um, in practical application when we start using these TEKS with all of our students. Um, and again, a lot of those do happen in middle school. So moving to um, the 6.10, again, simplified structure of the earth. They do need to be able to model it and um, describe the layers. And then the rock cycle is also being simplified. So they still have to know like metamorphic, igneous, and sedimentary. But we're, we're, we're looking at classifying them by how they're formed as opposed to their characteristics. So they really want to not necessarily be able to look at a rock and go, oh, that's sedimentary because of this, this, and this. They want to know um, sedimentary rocks are formed, you know, by layers of sediment. And metamorphic rocks are formed by like really focusing on that um, classification by how they're formed. Um, okay, so yeah, if I switch to the new TEKS this year, will my sixth graders be responsible? So this year um, in fifth and eighth grade, they are testing on the current 2017 streamlined TEKS. Next year, they will test on the new TEKS. Um, but they have said that they won't test on anything that's going to be missed for those sixth graders and eighth graders who are, or fifth graders and eighth graders who are moving to the new TEKS. So, yeah, um, they're still testing this year on the new TEKS. And that's, that's why it's so tough. So if you're a sixth grade teacher, your kids don't get tested till eighth grade. Um, by eighth grader, they're going to test on the TEKS that are being eliminated, not eliminated. If it's going away, then they're not going to be tested on them at all after this year. But the gaps, I don't know. It's uh, that TA is, that's all that they've said is that they won't test on the gaps for the first year. So I, that's the best I can answer your question. I'm sorry. Um, that's all we know from TA is that they won't test on them for the first year. So sixth graders should have, if they, if you started the TEKS this year, they're going to get all new TEKS this year and next year. They should actually have everything by eighth grade. But, um, but according to TEA, you're not really supposed to implement the new standards until next year. So it becomes a, that's why we say it's kind of a district decision. And I've, we have uh, throughout EdgeSmart, we have some districts that are implementing sixth grade this year. We have some districts that are implementing part of sixth grade this year and some that are not touching anything until next year. So it, it kind of, you have to weigh the, the options on those. 
and there's no simple answers. Um, for the rest of sixth grade, um, 611 is mostly new. Uh, in fact, 611A is completely changed from what it was. It used to kind of be about, you know, broadly about energy. Um, but now we're focusing on resource management, not just about energy, but read this standard. It says research and describe why resource management is important to reduce global energy, poverty, malnutrition, and air and water pollution. Like that's solve the world's problems in one standard. So good luck, sixth grade teachers, because you now get to solve the world's problems. Um, <laughs> but it is uh you know, research and describe. They need to be made aware. They need to have that foundational knowledge of why this is important. So again, this goes back to our anchoring phenomenon of um, the history of the world in a minute. This is the solutions to the world in a teak, right? Um, we do our best. And then also new is explain how conservation increases efficiency and the how technology can help manage air, water, soil, and energy resources. So those two really do go together. We're researching resource management and how to solve the world's problems by using things like more efficient methods and technology. So hopefully we can figure out how to do that. Um, of course, I just more has you covered. We have some really great like um, uh, engineering design challenges like one of them they are looking at different sprinklers and how different sprinklers work and designing the most effective um, system to be able to water the soccer field at their school um, with the least amount of waste so it's like taking all of that information and really making it very practical okay this is our football field or our soccer field and it's really important that this you know stay in good shape because we want to be able to play on it but we need to manage it the best way we can what's the best way to do that and they they research um, different types of sprinklers and how they work and then they put together an overall plan to make that um, to make that happen so you know, that's just one idea of ways that you can do it, but those kind of engineering challenges where we're looking at big picture and then still making it practical for the kids, you know, they care about, most of them are going to care about something like that. Um, it helps to bring this down to a level that makes it more manageable. Um, as I was going through the, uh, going through and making my notes on this and everything, seventh grade, like it's just it's just a mess like everything about seventh grade for reporting category three especially is just take a deep breath eat some chocolate it's gonna be okay we'll make it through um but seventh grade is almost all new very few very few of the standards have stayed um again we have helped out by deleting human space exploration entirely Catastrophic events has moved to grade eight, so you no longer have to teach catastrophic events. And we are no longer teaching weathering, erosion, and deposition in the eco regions of Texas. So that does take quite a bit off because, you know, eco regions was a big one. Um, but now you're adding tectonic plates. So that's also a big one. Um, so starting with 7.9, this is um, the solar system. So we're looking at and understanding how all of these uh, objects in the solar system move because of gravity. Um, so they need to understand that term of gravity and how it makes all of the objects orbit, rotate, revolve, all of those great things. Um, and then they have added a couple of extra objects in the Kuiper belt and the Oort cloud including meteors, asteroids, and comets, as well as the sun, moon, and planets. So it's pretty much everything in the solar system, and they have to know how it works. Um, we also are still explaining how, like, the sea hasn't changed the characteristics on Earth that allow life to exist. That is exactly the same. So, you know, composition of the atmosphere and all of that. The tectonic plates is all, move, all new and has moved from eighth grade 
Um, and these two move from eighth and from sixth. So this is where seventh grade teachers make sure you get with your colleagues because they have great lessons on how to teach this that will just need to be tweaked as opposed to reinventing the wheel and starting over. Um, the new this 710 um, B where it's describe the evidence that supports that the earth has changed over time, including fossil evidence, plate tectonics and superposition. A lot of that is new. Uh, we can focus here on that, the cause and effect and also on the scale like change over time. This is obviously a huge change over a very long period of time. We're talking geological time. But wow, there's a lot to unpack with just that one standard. Um, Fossil superposition is probably new for uh, just the terminology, maybe new for, for a lot of us, but that's just how um, things get laid down um, in order. And so you can kind of look back through the layers of rock or um, dig down through the layers of ice and be able to see how things happen in order. Um, and being able to find fossils within that is helpful. We'll look in a little bit after our break, which is coming up very soon, I promise. Uh, after break, we'll look at a couple of practical ways to teach this new standard, um, along with some of the other new standards. And then um, in the conservation part for 7-Eleven, we focus on the hydrosphere. So seventh grade already taught groundwater and surface water. That hasn't changed. Um, except that now we're looking at the beneficial and harmful influence of humans on groundwater and surface water in a watershed. So we're looking at how we can make it better as well as how we're polluting and making it worse. So that's kind of a nice change. We're looking for solutions. We're making this practical again. Um, but we are also adding that human dependence on ocean systems, which has moved from eighth grade and it is now a higher level of verb. A more rigorous verb. So we're going to need to get information on that from our eighth grade colleagues and then tweak it a little bit to make it um, in there because they now have to um, describe, which is a higher level, not just understand, but actually describe. And then finally, eighth grade, again, we deleted plate tectonics that moved down to seventh grade. We deleted topographical maps, which was just like banging your head against a wall. Um, tides has moved down to sixth grade. So there's some really good news for eighth grade uh, in this reporting category. Um, not much change to 8.9. We added a little specificity as far as like categorizing galaxies. They listed the specific type that they need to know, spiral, elliptical, and irregular. That's it. So that was kind of nice. Um, most of it is just, you still have to do the HR diagram. Sorry, you're not getting out of that one. But um, otherwise, it's just real small changes. 810, the biggest change here is that we're really looking at the interactions. So they're no longer having to learn how to read a weather map because they want to look at global patterns of weather. Um, so that's uh, actually taking out that, you know, the the lines and the little arrows on a weather map. That's probably a really good thing. But we do need to know the overall patterns uh, um, in the oceans and what that does to to weather on the planet. And then they added the specific terms, um, cyclones, hurricanes, and typhoons. So basically, they just need to know where each of those things happens and what relationship they have to each other. So that one's not going to be too bad. 811 is um, interesting because it is like the culmination of all that conservation that the students have learned about since kindergarten now. We've talked about conservation and using natural resources and how we can um, change our choices to make you know less impact on those natural resources. So now this there's only three standards here. A and B are both use scientific evidence to describe. And then A is natural events and B is human events or human activities. And they are very specific. Like the natural events is about volcanic eruptions, meteor impacts, abrupt changes in ocean currents, um, and the release and absorption of greenhouse gases. 
And then the human activities are specifically greenhouse gases, deforestation, and urbanization. So you take everything that they've learned and really help them put it together into understanding the difference between the two and the impact of climate change and why we're experiencing climate change. And then describing the carbon cycle, that's actually a good one too because it has, um, it used to include like nitrogen cycle and all of that. So now it's just carbon cycle. Okay, do you have a good topic? All right. So at this point, what questions before we go to break? Any questions, comments, ideas, thoughts? Feel free to come off chat. I've been talking a lot, I know, with these specific um, changes, but it's kind of important to kind of to have the overall view. So anything y'all want to add to that or patterns or anything you're noticing? One thing also with that, um, the climate change, it's interesting is that they focus on both historical climate change and modern climate change. So it puts it into a historical context, but also shows like how things are changing now. So it's kind of cool. There's lots of great opportunities there to make that very cross-curricular. This would be a great time to get your social studies team and your language arts team involved and math, of course, there's lots of math you can do with these um, to get everybody involved in uh, some kind of cross curricular projects. All right, so with that, um, we'll take a nice long break um, because I have been talking a lot and everyone needs to kind of clear their mind before we, we're gonna go to breakout rooms after a break. We're gonna look at a couple of specific lesson activities and ideas. And then we'll go to breakout rooms and be able to um, compare lesson plans and ideas and share and collaborate. So it's 1023. Uh, let's do, let's do 35. We'll come back at 1040. Uh, if that's good for everyone, that's basically 15 minutes. I will be here after a few minutes. I'm going to take a quick break and then I'm going to be on uh, mute, but you're welcome to come ask any questions. Uh, or anything, I'll be here for that. Any comments you might have. Otherwise, we will come back at 1040 and continue. Thank y'all. All right, y'all. So I have put an attendance check link in the um, in the chat box. So it's just a couple of questions to fill out and um, you will get your CTE certificate um based on that form so if you would just go ahead and fill in the attendance form and um i apologize that the the links or the um, certificates for the first session this month did not go out yet but they're working on them right now so those will be going out today hopefully or tomorrow by the latest and then the ones for this session will go out probably early next week and then we're meeting, we have another session next Thursday and then the following Monday to make up for the session we missed last week. So um, usually it only takes a couple of days. We just <laughs> kind of got off track on this last one. But please do fill out that attendance check. Um, that's how we do your credit for um, CTE, three hours of CTE for attending today. So um, coming back, any any questions, comments, anything about uh, anything we've talked about so far with this reporting category? Anyone want to um, like I, I my my just I just can't get over the fact that we took out space exploration. <laughs> you know, I'm just so bummed about that. Not only was it my favorite thing to teach, but I such a like so important in in the news and everywhere, and we're not teaching it. So. All right, well, we'll have time to chat when we go to breakout rooms in just a moment. Um, we do want to kind of just just hit on, you know, the the new teaks starting in 2024 are going to uh, have those recurring themes and concepts woven throughout them. And some topics fit better with some of the uh, recurring themes than others. Um, you could make an argument for absolutely all of those recurring themes to be applied to Earth and space. Um, but most 
easily connected, most like um, interwoven with the standards are probably these four recurring themes, scale, proportion and quantity, including time scale, uh, cause and effect, patterns and systems and system models, which those are actually built into the actual like knowledge and skill statement is that this is all systems models. So um, it's really important to be able to frame the lesson within these concepts. And remember using, we did a whole session on recurring themes and concepts. You're welcome to look back over it. I did put a link in the chat to the EdgeSmart webinar page. Uh, which has all the past webinars and workshops that we've done, and they are also posted on our YouTube channel. But um, scale, proportion, and quantity, we're looking at not only the size and the scope of our um, solar system, like the relative size of our solar system, but also that time frame. And so anything that talks about changes over time is going to fit beautifully in the scale, proportion, and quantity. And recurring themes should be taught explicitly like it makes sense to me as an adult with experience in science that when i'm talking about changes over time i'm looking at the scale of time but we don't want to assume that our kids are making those connections so we really want to explicitly say you know this is we're talking about time scale here and the time scale for the earth is very different than the time scale of a human like we want to make those connections explicit for our students um proportion and quantity we're really talking you know weather and catastrophic events as because you know the the scale of a catastrophic event depends on its severity um, we can talk about a, a category one hurricane versus a category five hurricane, um, but we also want to talk about that proportion. So um, proportion and conservation resources. If you're talking about um, changes to an ecosystem, um, we're talking about the amount of uh, human impact. You know, that's when that scale proportion really comes into play. So if one person is littering, that's one thing. But if 7 billion people are littering, that becomes a whole different scale. The proportions are changed. So that's where we can really bring in all of those kind of um, recurring themes. But again, we want to make it explicit with the recurring themes. They need to be we're helping our students make these connections. Now, over time, we want them to be able to make the connections themselves. But until they're more familiar with these uh, overarching concepts, we're gonna have to really help them see those connections. For cause and effect, I mean, anything to do with the earth is going to have a cause and effect relationship, basically. Like, why does the sun um, look like it comes up and goes down every day? Why do we have that day night cycle? Why do the seasons change? Well, you know, the tilt of the earth is the cause. The effect is that part of the earth is hotter during part of the year. Um, the movement of tectonic plates is the, re the direct result of or the direct cause of volcanoes and hotspots. Um, hotspots is new in the standards, hotspots and super volcanoes. Um, we've probably talked about them before, but now they're they're actually stated. Um, cause and effect, weathering, erosion, and deposition. It's easy to connect those concepts. Weather, hurricanes, catastrophic events, and again, that conservation and um, impact of human activities. For patterns, you know, uh, again, these seem obvious to us, but as they are learning the recurring themes, the pattern of day night, the pattern of shadows, I'll show you a, a simulation that EdgeSmart did um, that shows the pattern of shadows and it's it's great because it shows how the pattern changes um, by looking at the shadows it's a really neat one um, all of these things are are based on patterns we want to explicitly point out the pattern anytime it says cycle you've got some kind of pattern <laughs> and there, there were full of patterns within the um the this reporting category and then finally the systems and systems models um, probably this is one of the most broad recurring themes um, and just about any of our standards are going to fit into it. But when your knowledge and skill statement specifically says, look at the system, look at the natural world as a system, we really want to make sure that we're um, like reinforcing that concept. 
the earth as a system um like biosphere hydrosphere atmosphere and geosphere and how those interact a lot of it is the interaction within a system the this reporting category has a lot to do with weather and climate so what is the interaction within the atmosphere that, that's causing the short-term weather and the long-term climate how how is the ocean affecting that like that system of movement um, and then the effect of the movement of tectonic plates is obviously the earth system the geosphere um, and being able to look at it as a full system so those are just um kind of supports for you if we as teachers can start thinking of these concepts in terms of the recurring themes it's going to help us to place it in context for our students and then we use the science and engineering practices as how do we do the science here like these are why we do it this is the overarching concept of it the standards is the content and then the science and engineering practices are the how we do it we do have a cool uh freebie for you here we created like a one pager this is basically a anchor chart that you could have in your room that has all the recurring themes and what they mean so obviously you know we could look at energy and matter we could look at stability and change in terms of earth and space um but we don't want to overwhelm the kids with too much as far as yes every single one of these would apply to all of the standards in some way but we're giving them a lens with the reporting or the re recurring themes so it's best to kind of focus the lens and not make it too broad um before we go to breakouts uh, we are just going to take a look at some of the new standards and give you some ideas of how these can be approached. Now, I'm going to use EdgeSmart resources to show how we are approaching instruction on these. Um, if you're not an EdgeSmart customer, there's lots of ways you can do this. These are just ways to get you generating ideas and thinking about this is what the standard is wanting us to teach. So starting um, with first grade, this is where they really start like kindergarten um they do need to like they start to use um, earth materials and why they're important but in first grade is when we start calling them natural resources and really make that foundational conservation um foundation of conservation so this is going to be really really crucial that the um, that the students understand uh sorry let me just go into the edge smart system and re-log in i'm going to go to first grade we're looking at reporting category three and i'm looking at using natural resources and i think i was going to highlight the instruction module on this one so again, super foundational for um, how this should be, how this can be introduced and taught. And this one's real short. Everyone is making animal models in art class. Ava made a dinosaur and Kevin's rabbit is looking good too. What are the dinosaur and the rabbit models made of? So if you're familiar with that just more, this is a pause where we could start that conversation of natural materials and what are they possibly made of and they're going to say things like play doh and you know talk about clay and what's play doh made of and all of that stuff. They are made of clay, which is a type of soil and pebbles, which are tiny rocks. Water was also used for making the clay soft. Soil rocks and water are resources found in nature. All living things need them to live and grow. How does soil help living things? Plants need soil to hold their roots. They get water and nutrients from the soil. Many animals like rabbits, earthworms, beetles, and ants dig into soil and use it as shelter. We grow our food and food for animals in soil. We also use soil to make useful things like mugs and bricks. How are rocks useful? 
So the reason I wanted to point this one out is because it's really great at showing explicitly you need to connect how plants use rock, soil, and water, how animals use rock, soil, and water, and how humans use rock, soil, and water. So it has to like cover all different combinations of that. There's a lot to unpack within that standard. Rocks are also useful to build shelters. Humans use rocks to build homes and even large structures like castles. Some animals like penguins make nests from rocks. Otters use rock to break open shellfish. Some birds swallow tiny pieces of rock to break down their food. Rocks help plants by stopping soil from blowing or washing away. How is water useful to living things? Plants need water to grow and make their own food. Some animals live in or around water. We use water for drinking, bathing, washing, and for fun stuff like swimming and water balloon fights. Wait, Kevin, the models need to be left to dry before painting. Time to grab some lunch. And then it's just going to go into a summary of that standard. So again, that that foundation of, you know, these things are these are things that we have to have, we have to use, we need, but how do we conserve them to make sure that they last? Um, and so that's a first grade, that's that foundation in first grade. Moving to second grade, this is now where severe weather has um, is first introduced. Um, so before this, it was, you know, a little bit older grade level, um, and it, this can be a little scary for some kids. So one way that we, that EdgeSmart did this is a simple card match. So if you look at, let me get these cards up. It's a, it's basically an I, um, I have who has, and it has not only the definition of the word, but it also has the word itself and then a picture image. We'll go through there of what it might look like in real life. A super simple card sort. They could do it um, in lots of different ways. You could have them up and moving in the room and you know going to different places to be able to match them up, finding different people, making it super collaborative um, to really get them to know it. And that kind of takes a little bit of the anxiety maybe out. Um, because if a, if a student has experienced trauma due to one of these events, it's going to be, um, you want to make sure that you're supporting them as they're going through that process. So a simple card sort can really help to just make it more collaborative. And I think that that would help that support feature as they're learning about severe weather as second graders. Um, again, we talked a lot about these mini erosion tables. So this is a super simple version um, from second grade through eighth grade. Basically, there is a use for a mini erosion table. These little totes, this is actually an activity that we did at CAS this last year. These little totes are a dollar at the dollar store, along with a plastic squirt bottle, which is also a dollar at the dollar store. Um, in second grade, they start learning about how water can move rocks and soil, and they specifically have to know the different types of soil. So I would have a couple of different types of soil and let them see, you know, let them experience water movement. Um, there's a fancy version of this from lab aids that has an easier way for the runoff to occur. Um, you can actually make your own with this plastic and just put like a, a little spout in the bottom of it. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos on how to make one, but I didn't even have the water draining out. Like I would just use, and I taught seventh grade for many years where I would use this activity and just have a whole bunch of them for each group and then let it dry out after we were done. You can use bricks, rocks, um, very carefully use straws to simulate wind. 
um, have little pieces of, of vegetation to help like make a river and how they move the river. There's a million ways that you can use these little boxes full of sand or dirt or clay or gravel um, at every grade level. So, and then this is a fairly easy one to store and be able to have accessible as well. But man, these things are useful for any of those processes that shape the earth. Um, you can even do like, you know, sand dunes and how sand dunes are formed. Um, there's ways you can use these with tectonic plates, like very, very useful, highly recommend. <laughs> we'll just say that. Thanks. Tides, again, are new to sixth grade. This used to be an eighth grade standard and it's moving down to sixth grade. And you have to be able to teach that tides are a result of the gravitational pull of the moon, but they don't really get taught about gravity as um, a force that like moves things in the solar system until seventh grade. So they, they've heard of gravity by this point. Um, they know it's part of gravity, like they've been exposed to it in other reporting categories, but as far as the attraction between planets and how this moves it, um, it's kind of a tough one to explain. I use the student review on this one. It's a shorter version of the instruction module and it's gonna ask some like formative questions in there. Um, but it, it really does a great job of explaining each of the different phases of the tides. Tides are the periodic rise and fall of the sea level during a day. Do you know what causes the tides? The sun, moon, and earth exert gravitational forces on each other. This causes tides. Uh, and I'm just going to answer real quickly so we can move on to the next segment. Imagine that Earth has a uniform amount of water all around it. The moon's gravity pulls the water on Earth toward it. This causes the water to slightly bulge on the side of Earth facing the moon. Beaches on this side of Earth experience high tide. At the same time, Earth is also pulled a little toward the moon and a bulge of water is left behind on its opposite side. Therefore, when it is high tide on one side of Earth, it is also high tide on the other side of Earth. Regions that are perpendicular to the moon have low tides. During one complete rotation, every point on Earth experiences a high tide when it faces the moon, a low tide when it is at a right angle to the moon, another high tide when it faces away from the moon, and a final low tide when it is again at a right angle to the moon. And then um, this is, you know, practical application question. And it's asking um, where would the tides occur? And they're going to need lots of practice with this, being able to interpret Try it. Try again. So uh, here we're just... I didn't actually read the question, but it's going to make sure that they understand what happened. But look at the terminology here. Um, we need to know parallel and perpendicular. Um, they need to know, you know, right angles. They need to be able to interpret that diagram with correctly with each of the terminologies. So there's a lot Although to unpack. Although tides are caused mainly by the gravitational attraction between Earth and the moon, the effect of the sun's gravity is greatly felt at the full moon and the new moon phases. That is when the sun, the moon, and earth are aligned on the same axis. The combined gravitational force of the sun and the moon on earth's waters lead to higher high tides and lower low tides. These are called spring tides. During the first quarter and third quarter phases, the sun, the moon, and earth are perpendicular to each other. This decreases the gravitational force between them, which causes the lowest high tides and the highest low tides. These are called neap tides. All right, so uh, that I just wanted you to kind of see like exactly how that um, how that would be taught as far as, you know, that's probably a new standard unless you taught eighth grade. That's a brand new concept. And most of us as humans don't necessarily understand the tides all that well. Um, so that's kind of a way that you can actually explain them. Seventh grade, so <laughs> pretty much all of it, like uh, I'm going to go to seventh grade here within our content library and um, pretty much anything you look at within this this library is going to be new. 
I, unfortunately, all of it, other than watersheds. So, um, you know, seventh grade teachers really are going to just have to dig in a little bit, especially when we're talking things like tectonic plates and, you know, the movement of all of those um, celestial bodies like asteroids and meteors and comets in the Oort cloud and all of that. Um, it, it may take some building up of your own knowledge before you begin learning with your students. And I do think, in my opinion, especially with these new standards and the way we're going into 3D learning, um, it's okay to acknowledge that you're learning with your students. Like, it's gonna happen. I did want to point out like that superposition is kind of a new concept. And so um, in our instruction module companion, we have a great visual of what that super um, superposition would look like. So again, it's the layering of rocks um, over time. And so as layers get placed down um, over time, you can kind of see what was going on in the world based on that layer. And so here it's talking about, well, there was a shell found in this layer and that is going to tell us that at that time in the earth's history that piece of land was underwater um, it'll show you the different types of organisms that uh, like lived in that place in that time and so superposition it's it's a little um intimidating maybe but it really is just showing how we read the rock layers or the sediment layers in order to understand the Earth's history. And once you look at it, like in this kind of diagram form, it's really not quite so intimidating. It's something that is fairly intuitive to understand as being able to um, explain what happened in an area over time. So that is superposition. And then, um, We've talked a lot about how the new standards are all about conservation, and they are. There, there's there's a whole like section for conservation of natural resources and application of that um, throughout every single grade level, and it builds up to this culmination of understanding not only the human impact but also the natural causes and how it has changed over time, the mini ice age and things like that. So, oh, that's not the one I was looking for. So in eighth grade, um, being able to, I'll go to that earth and space, being able to see, we, we, they need to understand climate and weather, but then being able to see how climate has changed naturally over time, as well as what the human impact of climate is, is super important for, um, for the students to be able to, to articulate that. And again, really great opportunity for some cross-curricular cross connections um, because it's, it's hard to fit in anyways, but that's just, um, that's an opportunity that they can see, uh, you know, how everyone is impacted by this. Um, so that's just kind of a couple of quick ideas and lessons on some of the more challenging material. There's plenty of it to go around. Um, if you need additional help, just let us know. We'd be happy to walk you through with EdgeSmart, like some of the material that, um, that you'll need to teach that. But now I do want to make sure we have plenty of time to do um, some collaborating. Uh, being able to share lessons across grade levels is gonna be crucial because the lessons are out there. We just need to be able to get them from the right place. So um, I'm going to invite you to a breakout room. And this is just a share -thon. like have that discussion of ways that you can teach things, lab ideas, um, overall impressions of the standards and how the vertical alignment might work, anything, everything to do with that. Uh, as I open up the break rooms, if you don't get the invitation, please just let me know and I will put you where you want to go. So you're, you get to decide whether you go to elementary or secondary. And you should receive an invitation to join one of these rooms. I'll be popping in and out just to check on everyone, see how you're doing and give you any resources you might need. Yes, I will.
let's see. So, uh, Miss Wolf, let me. Do you want like a vertical alignment for the teaks, or do you want the side by side? Because the side by sides are like by grade level, but the vertical alignment would be through like kindergarten through fifth, and then sixth through bio. I don't know which one I want. Um, I like the one we had the week before last. So that was the one on matter. Yeah. Okay. Was that the side by side? I think it was. I think it was the side by side. Okay. Uh, is there a specific grade level you want for that? Sixth grade. Gotcha. Thank you. And, okay. And the vertical. Well, I don't know. I didn't know what I wanted. <laughs> There's so much out there, so no surprise. Because vertical would be comparing the different grades, right? Uh, yes. Well, it okay. would show, you know, let me just give you both. Okay. So this is the link for the uh, sixth grade side by side. Okay. Here's the, um, oops, uh, here is the secondary vertical alignment. And then I wanna go ahead and give you the, the elementary two because fifth grade is on the uh, elementary vertical alignment. Thank so you so much. No, no problem. But I know, I wanna tell you, I was planning with, the other sixth grade teacher I teach with, and we were referring to that, but somehow I got thrown out of it. And then I couldn't get into it again. <laughs> <laughs> it is super useful. So thank you. Absolutely. I guess I better go join my, there. but I really appreciate this. We're, our, we're ha anything we can do to make it easier because we know this is gonna be a challenge. So <laughs> there's no question. Oh, yes, it is. And the thing is, nobody seems to really know. In our district, we haven't been told what's going on yet. So you like, don't know if you're implementing the new ones yet? No, but what we did is when we got together to plan, because last year we didn't have a coordinator. Uh -huh. They had a hard time hiring someone for that position. So when we got together to plan, we looked at um we decided we're going to plan for the new takes if at all <laughs> possible and we're just going to make sure we cover the ones that are being taken out of our grade level that'll still be on the eighth grade test yeah I, and i know I, I was trying to answer your question earlier about that because according to tea if it's been taken out they shouldn't test them on that but if it's in if they're sixth graders now they're not getting tested for two years so they've only told us what they plan on doing for next year we don't really know about what happens after that so um, does our plan to to start the new takes this year but make sure we include the things that are being taken out of our curriculum that are on the test because you know only certain things are on the eighth grade test yes so yes what we did is we those supporting it, we standards Mm -hmm. We made sure even if they're being taken out, we're still teaching them this year. Does that sound like a decent plan? It does. The only thing I would suggest is to make sure if if it is taught um, in seventh grade, you might want to double check it because because um, otherwise they'll get that next year. Like if a oh, standard a has point. it's like speed is moving to seventh grade. Next yes. Year. Yes, exactly. So you don't have to worry about that because they will get it next year, you know. Um, so yeah, okay, there, so we'll there might be some overlap. That, which actually takes a little. A little bit, a little help off. <laughs> and then like density, I don't know where dens calculating density may have been totally taken out. Um, they We're don't have the density to. Of liquids. They don't have to calculate it anymore. They have to compare it. So it's now right. uh, like a relative scale. But this year we should teach calculating density because that could theoretically end up on their test. 
Yes. Because that's, but we can do that while we're doing the comparing density stuff. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. I would say that's a pretty good plan because you, because we can't guarantee that it's not going to end up on the test. Um, Okay. And that's actually, you know, especially with that one, it's well, it, it see, is a higher that level. Makes it a huge benefit. I mean, like speed is on our current curriculum, but if we mm -hmm. start next year, seventh grade has to teach all that stuff. And right. if we taught all of it already, you know what the kids go in there, they're just shut down because they don't, they're like, well, you already know all this stuff. Right. Yeah. So that's not fair to seventh grade. So, okay, that was helpful. Thank you for that conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, you bet. <laughs> because we're like, we had this problem with sex ed last year because they didn't really have a person that, we have a position, it just wasn't filled. Yeah. And so other people were filling in and we did not get good guidance. Mm -hmm. So this year we just decided this is what we're going to do because one, we are either not going to get good guidance again this year, or they're not going to tell us till the first week of school. And we want to have a plan beyond that. Yes. Yes. You know. I, I came from a district that very was very similar with that. And at some point you're just like, you know what, this is how it's going to happen because this is what I can do in my classroom. So that seems like y'all have, you know, taken all of all of the changes and everything that's happening into account while still maintaining I what think you we have and most to do. Of it, I've taught at some point because I've been teaching 33 years. So mm -hmm. it's like, oh, I still have this lesson. We'll use this slideshow. And I mean, then if the district puts in their curriculum, we can compare it to what we have. But mm -hmm. if they don't for the new curriculum, I'm just like, you know what? In the past, they've had sixth grade go a year before. Mm -hmm. And this year, it, I've checked with people in a lot of different districts throughout the state, and some are changing, some are not. Exactly. <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> You're like, that, oh, I mean, it's just going to be all over the place. And I asked my principal, she didn't know, so I just told her, okay, this is the plan we developed, because <laughs> we're meeting in the summer to get most of this planned, mm -hmm. because we're going to get a new teacher that we're going to have to support and all this stuff. We want every as much in place. <laughs> yeah. To save your sanity while the school year is going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, so anyways, okay. Thank you. That helps a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, okay. Can I share those links for those teaks with the coworker? Absolutely. Okay. Because yeah, we're we're happy to share any of the documents and everything we've created. You know, okay. do that. I send them to anybody. Get that, like the copy and paste into anything when mm -hmm. we were working the other day. But if I can share her the links, then she can open it up. Because looking at the teaks in that format was very helpful mm -hmm. as we were trying to plan, especially because we were trying to see like. New takes, old takes. Where do they get, where do they ever get exposed to this concept? And yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. now, yeah, no. Nope. The one you gave us last time, did it have seventh and eighth in it too? Oh, but I have that. You the vertical alignment it. does. I can send you a side by side for seventh and eighth if you want those. Oh, could you give me those too? Absolutely. Because one of our teachers is teaching both six and seven. She'll have three, six, three, seven. Hmm. I know. Oh, you must be in a smaller district. No, we're actually in a bigger district. Really? I'm in Austin. Oh, wow. Because I mean, that sounds, I, I thought, mm -hmm. go ahead. We have two full time and then the third teacher teaches half and half. I see. And I see. that'll be a new teacher position. Unless they take one of us and move us into it. I, I taught in a smaller district and we definitely would, you know, we had those kind of doubled up, tripled up kind of teachers. So this is seventh grade I just sent you. Thank you. And... Grade eight. Because 
it's either going to be one of us or they haven't hired anybody for that last position yet. <laughs> so it'll either be one of us that has to move to teaching both, which I'm trying to get out of if I can. <laughs> like, please or tell the, me, maybe the teacher, but I will still be working with this person, you know, uh -huh. and helping them out, whoever it is. Well, um, you know, it's it's hard to find teachers right now. Is the problem? I know. Well, see, we we had an open eighth grade position all last year. Oh, yeah. We hired. We did actually hire someone. I think in October, but he wasn't certified, and he lasted like a month. <laughs> so the rest of the year, those eighth graders had a sub. Oh. Awesome. So yes, I've prepared for the fact that we might also have a sub teaching sixth, seventh all year. Yeah. Which I'm praying doesn't happen, but. Unfortunately, it's, you know, a lot of places are warm bodies. Just give me a warm body at this point. I know. I also went ahead and sent you the fifth grade side by side because that, you know, building up into sixth grade, that way you'll have. Oh, perfect. You have that. Oh, this is so helpful. I'm so glad that makes my day. So I feel bad I'm missing out on the other thing, but I'll go join them in just a minute. Yeah, because you know, they, they might be very helpful too. <laughs> uh, I think they will, because I have found it super helpful to have that information. Mm -hmm. And we, the one good thing at our school is the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teachers do a fantastic job of working together. Mm -hmm. And I like this idea instead of trying to reinvent the wheel on some mm -hmm. of the things that are moving from one grade level to another, just I'll give them my lessons and they'll give me theirs. I, I think that's the only way to do it this year, especially for middle school, is we're just going to have to share and, and compare and give what we can because it's not... <laughs> there's just so much new and you can't make all new stuff for that and there's no need to you know i mean there's great lessons out there to teach all of these concepts so there is and i will tell you what you know like they're taking away the space exploration yes i did a thing where like it's a it talks about um and I'll talk about one type of space exploration and we'll have a little discussion. Then I show like a three to four minute video on that event. Yeah. And then we go through another one and so on. And I'm going to do that the last couple of days of school after all uh -huh. the breaking thing because the kids love it. Yes. Yes. And, and it's so timely. And, you know, they see it on the news every day. Well, so. they need to know it. They do. They really do. They do. Um, but. I'm going to do that the last couple of days of school because I'm always teaching until the end anyways. My kids complain, but uh -huh. it's got a lot of videos mixed in and they, they're they interested in the videos because, you know, the right. first monkey in space, the first. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I don't know. I've, I think that it would also be, um, I think one of the things that we'll have to do is make it an after school club or an elective. You know, that would be a really great STEM based elective school after all grades are in because my kids are paying attention to that unit yes they want to see it they do and so even if I don't have grading and I like it better because the way I've got it set up it's not like they're just watching a movie right because yes I've got it set up so we go through it in a timeline mm -hmm. and we discuss each one as we add one you know oh <laughs> and we I'm glad it warms my heart to hear <laughs> I'm glad to hear that it's still going to be taught because, yeah, well, that I don't know everyone will, but that's what I'm going to yeah. do with that because I mm -hmm. think if it's been taken out, it needs to be added in. Yeah. And it's the one thing, it's one of those things my kids wouldn't fight me on the last week. Exactly. You know, because last week the kids are used to doing nothing in most of their classes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's so such a I'm high interest. That to the end. Yeah. That's a great spot for it. So I think it solves a lot of those problems because I don't have to worry about if they're paying attention or they're <laughs> excited. They, they are excited about it. It's one of those things I never have to fight them on. Yeah, even the last week, that's something they will sit and focus for. Uh-huh. 
and at least they're not just sitting watching movies. I mean, yes, I have a lot of many videos in there. Yeah. But there's a lot of discussion and stuff going on too. Right. Well, and some of that stuff you just have to see to believe, you know, when you, they start seeing yeah. and getting the impact of rockets and of, you know, the it, people out in the ISS and all of that. So. Well, and at my age, I've seen most of those. Now. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's important stuff. Well, and that, that's the other thing is, you know, with the Artemis going on right now, and within just a couple of years, we're going to have people walking on the moon, and we're going to have our first female on the moon and our first person of color on the moon. It's so timely and so, um, you know, brings in that equity factor for our kids. We want yeah. them to be seeing that. Well, and like one of the things I included was the first Britain, you know, like at yes. first it was people in most countries could not go into space mm -hmm. and so there's a lot that they you know learn about that and how it's evolving yeah so exactly and like when the war broke out I put the thing in about how you know there were Russians and Americans um in space together and they got along even though before the Ukraine had broke out because they were co-workers. They already knew each other. They, they had, had to. to. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But they were friends before and it's not like all of a sudden we're going to be out of these. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't much they could do about it. <laughs> uh, no, there wasn't. They had to. Okay. Well, I am going to go join my group. Sorry. Okay. I'm joining late but I truly appreciate that information that was helpful oh you bet absolutely okay thank you <laughs> thank you bye-bye all right y'all so um thank you so much y'all uh, there was some really great discussions going on in both rooms that I was able to catch a few minutes of um it sounds like we got some great ideas shared and some even some planning time so that's awesome um as we kind of just reflect for a moment, we want to kind of think about um, overall your impressions. And if anyone wants to share either anything that they struggle with, their main takeaways, or anything of the reflection questions about like, which grade levels do you think are going to be most affected? What content do you think we will as teachers most struggle with or as students most struggle with? Anybody want to share a little takeaway? I think a lot of who struggles is going to have to do with personalities and how people adjust to change. This is very true. Because I know years ago when we changed from six, focusing on physical science and seventh and eighth, the life science. And I mean, that was all I taught was physical science at the beginning. Mm hmm. And although I was the one who created most of the curriculum we were using at our school, the other two newer teachers were the ones most resistant to changing it. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute, I got my blood, sweat, and tears in this stuff, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah. So some of it's personalities. You know, I don't do everything the same every year. So, because I get bored if I do, mm -hmm. but I do a lot the same, you know, and I've looked at what's in the sixth grade changes and I'm like okay I'm comfortable with the amount of change I'll still have a lot of stuff I can pull from mm -hmm. there's some stuff I can pull from from years ago <laughs> and it's just plus I sort of enjoyed the challenge of that but seventh grade is going to have the biggest hit I think that's yeah. going to be hard for them I, I think there's just so much realignment for seventh grade and they have taught um, just basically life science for so long. In fact, talking about that personality differences, uh, my mentor and partner teacher, uh, she'd been teaching a little over 30 years and she took a look at the new teaks and retired. Like she's like, I'm done. She taught seventh grade for her, almost her entire career. And she's like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Just no. So she retired a couple of years earlier than she had planned because she didn't <laughs> want to deal with it. So uh, See, and that was 33 years in and I want to work a couple more. I haven't, yeah. it's not going to make me retire. Some good. other things might, but that won't. <laughs> <laughs> right. But good point at my 
point of the career row is I can just say that if something gets to me enough, I can just say I'm out of here. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think seventh grade is definitely going to struggle a little bit. I think our younger grades may struggle a little bit because there is, um, you know, it's much as they are already stretched so thin on time and priority and focus and you know we got to get their reading and math and everything and then trying to add um, some additional layers of complexity into the science instruction I think could um, challenge those early elementary especially um, to be able just to to keep up with the depth of the teaks the hands-on the investigate the model you know a little higher level thinking for those younger students but a lot of it's but see, that's because I've been here so long. A lot of it ties back to the scientific method. Yeah. And we used to teach that big time. So it's like, okay, yeah. Yeah. And I already do a lot of hands on. So. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that. I think uh, that is a really encouraging part of these new standards is, is that it does require hands on in the actual verbiage of the standard. So. I, I, every child needs that hands-on experience with science, especially with science, but with all their um, content, but you got to teach science with hands-on. So it's a good thing. All right. Awesome. Um, well, thank you all so much for, for being here and participating in this. Um, just to give you a little heads up, next week is reporting category four, that's organisms in the environment. And then the following week, we are rescheduling um, the one from last week that we missed. So that's reporting category two, force, motion, and energy. Um, so that will be Monday, July 31st. When you get this uh, link, it will have your uh, registration for it, for either of those two sessions that you want to attend. Um, if you're registered for the, if you had already registered for session two on uh, reporting category two, you'll automatically be registered for the new one. So we'll make sure you get in and get registered. Um, but if you haven't registered, then you'll be able to. Uh, and that will have the link on this Summer Workshop Series PDF. All of the links to all the material that you got today are free for you to share. So the vertical alignment documents, the side-by-sides, all of that, you know, feel free to share those with your district, um, any of your teaching partners, whatever, you're welcome to those. Um, if you would like, more PD for your district. If you're an EdgeSmart customer, we can actually do this series with your teachers or on your campus. Um, you know, just reach out to us or reach out to your um, science coordinators or district personnel, and we can arrange for additional PD as needed as well. So here is a link to all of the resources um, and including the, um, the last sessions. Like these are all the workshop the video and the slide deck for the workshops from earlier this summer and then we also have the you know all that's on our like our youtube channel or available on edgesmart.com um oh, i have to credit uh if y'all are not familiar with paul anderson he is amazing uh has great NGSS aligned content. So it's not Texas aligned. We have to be careful that, you know, it's not actually what we have, but there's some really good stuff on there, especially for anchoring phenomenon um, and ways to find really good anchoring phenomenon for different content. So I want to make sure and credit where it's due. And uh, it's called the Wonder of Science. It's a great spot. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. My email is leah at edgesmart.com. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for spending your summer morning with me. I really appreciate it. And the last thing, I'm going to stop my sharing. Um, so I found these amazing, let's see if I can get it, the set of earrings. You see that? They're the whole set. I'm sorry, gentlemen. This is Girl Talk. Uh, these earrings are, they're the entire series of planets. They were available on sale at um, Earthbound if you're familiar with that store. So I bet you could order these online too, but oh my gosh, look, they're the planets. <laughs> Every one of them. So have some fun with it, right? We're going to get some new content. We might as well enjoy it. So thank you all so much. And hopefully we'll see you next week. Bye y'all. <laughs>